I'm here basically to moderate, to pose a couple of questions or frame the discussion, and then um, once we've talked through a couple of points I know we're going to talk through, I'll, we'll have some time to take some questions from you guys. Um, I, I want to say a few things up at the start, too, but my main job once, uh, once I get the conversation rolling, my main job is to keep an eye on the clock and put the brakes on it so that we don't um, make the next panel late. Uh, I, I will also say, well, I, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, also say by way of introducing myself that um, my, my day job is uh, that I'm a professor at the University of Vermont and teach courses on the graphic novel and things like that. But I also am, uh, have been making mini comics for a long time and have just started publishing an anthology that I've got upstairs if you want to take a look at it. And also it's on Kickstarter right now. Uh, to, to fund the first 10 issues. And if you, uh, I was joking with uh, 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 Jamie Tanner, who works for Kickstarter, uh, last night about blockading the doors and insisting that you all get on your smartphones and back my Kickstarter right now. But I'm not going to do that because. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe, you know, later today. Also, it's my birthday today. So what would be the nicer than to. Thanks. You're alive. <laughs> I made it through. Uh, Happy birthday, Isaac. Thank you. Immortal so far. Um, but I, uh, th those are the, th that's all. You can come, come by my table if you want to see the thing that, I, that I've got up on Kickstarter. But um, what, uh, in a second, I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves. But I, I wanted to sort of frame the conversation briefly by saying that, you know, 10 years ago, the way that you would fund the publication of a self-published comic, a, a mini comic, would be uh, one of two ways. You could uh, go down to Kinko's or some other copy shop with your credit card uh, or your checkbook and pay them uh, however much it costs to print it. Or you could uh, work in a place where there was a Xerox machine and steal the copies. And th those were the two options basically mm -hmm. available for self-publishing. Now, there are a lot of other ways that you can gather up the money necessary to put something together and to put it together nicely uh, right from the start. And uh, what we're here to talk about today is essentially um, like the good things about that as a publishing model and even maybe some strategies for, uh, for doing it well. We can talk about that after you guys have introduced yourselves. But I also want to spend some time talking about criticisms that get leveled against crowdfunding in particular, but uh, against these sort of non-traditional methods of funding publication. Uh, because I think they're criticisms that need to be taken seriously and addressed, uh, whether or not we're, we're sort of like sympathetic toward them. We, we need to be thinking about them. So uh, those are the main things that we'll probably be talking about. But first, let me let the other people sitting in the front of the room uh, tell you who they are and what they work on and their experiences with, uh, let's say, non-traditional methods of funding self-publication. Okay. So Spike. Hi there, I'm Spike. Uh, I've done the whole stealing copy machine time thing. I've done the whole visiting Kinko's with a credit card thing. And uh, back in 2007, I put a thermometer looking graphic up on my site, trying to fund the very first volume of my webcomic Templar. And I made, I think, $4,000 in two weeks and I felt like a god. And um, I did stuff a lot like that, thermometers on my site when it was time to put out a volume of my webcomic. And then in 2009, a friend told me about this thing called Kickstarter. And uh, this is my first Kickstarter book. It got funded December of 2009, was finally com completed early 2012. Uh, Poor Craft is basically the book I wish someone had handed me when I turned 18. It asked for, I think, $6,000, ended up with $13,000 on Kickstarter, and uh, so that was my first project. Afterwards, I resurrected, you might be familiar with the Smut Peddler minis that went around the alternative and independent comic scene in the early noughties, appropriately enough. Uh, I resurrected it with help of the original editors into this juggernaut here. Uh, a 300-something page book of Smut that was Kickstarted. Uh, it asked for 20, and it got 83. And uh, it, when it finished out, was the ninth most funded Kickstarter, comic Kickstarter project on the site. It's been since well and truly eclipsed, but I was proud at the time. And uh, a few months ago, I Kickstarted a horror anthology called The Sleep of Reason. It asked for 20, and it ended up getting 47 about. And uh, I am a big proponent of Kickstarter. I went out to the Brooklyn Book Fair to be on their Kickstarter panel for comics. Uh, I see no reason to pretty much not use it with every project where it's even vaguely applicable. And I think it 
gives creatives a really powerful tool to be independent of people who up until very recently had no, they had no choice but to deal with who were very interested in exploiting them. So yeah. Uh, I'm Marnie Galloway. Um, my, for my day job, I design and do art direction for a <coughs> literary magazine for teenagers called Cicada, which is part of the Cricket Magazine group that publishes comics. If you have any teens in your life who love comics and smart literature, <coughs> Cicada. Um, I'm also a co-organizer of Cake, the Chicago Alternative Comics Expo. Um, and my project that I could talk about here today is a wordless comic that I'm working on called In the Sounds and Seas. Uh, I first published this as two minis. Uh, there's more volumes yet to come. The second volume of the minis was funded by a Chicago Arts Grant, the Chicago Arts Assistant Program Grant. And then I was able to publish this slightly more deluxe version, <laughs> Sneaking Under the Wire, with a Zarek grant in 2012. Uh, my name is Box Brown. I didn't bring my Kickstarter books with me. <laughs> uh, but I have used it three times. Uh, I, I used Kickstarter uh, for the first time, almost right after Spike did. For the, I've like, been following Spike's lead up, up, <laughs> it's, it's surreptitiously for a long time. <laughs> Um, and uh, I, I published, uh, self, I kick-started um, my um, series, Everything Dies, and I was able to raise enough money to publish um, the first two comics in a way that I wanted to. And then I did five or six more copy uh, issues of Everything Dies, and then um, I wanted to do something else, so I started Retrofit Comics, which is a publishing, became a publishing house kind of now. But that was originally a Kickstarter campaign. Um, <clears throat> And then I did Kickstarter again last year to fund this big anthology, and uh, <clears throat> it, it was uh, it's a successful anthology called Secret Prison 7 um, that I'm really proud of, but we received a decent amount of criticism from the comics community, RE, that, that Kickstarter campaign for some reason. Hmm. Let me tell you about criticism of, of anthologies. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll get to that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, Todd, do you want to? Oh, yeah, hi. <laughs> hey, uh, so I'm not a self-publisher. Uh, I didn't use Kickstarter to, uh, uh, to publish a book, so my experience is a little bit different, I guess. Uh, I had uh, been asked, I had been uh, asked to uh, do uh, some work for an anthology called Mome, uh, which is published by Fantagraphics Books, and I, I did a serialized comic in there <clears throat> for a for a uh, for a, 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 a few issues. I forget it was like five or six issues, but um, before I had done this, uh, uh, I um, was tr uh, trying to I, I was trying to uh, I used the money for travel basically, but also it was like, there was a purpose uh, in, in that, it was research and travel, basically. I couldn't, have, I couldn't have the money on my own, I tried to get a grant uh, through, um, oh, it was Alaska Geographic or Alaska Sea Grant, something like this, anyhow. Um, and I needed money to go to Juneau, to the State Archives in Juneau, and I wanted to get out to the Aleutian Islands uh, to do some, some research for this project, um, which is, oh, this, Book here, which is, this is volume one of the of the uh, the, the book that uh, this uh, that I've been working on for the past five years. Um, but uh, sorry, what was my point? Oh yeah, Kickstarter. Um, so I needed some money to get out there because I wanted to, I wanted to do some you know some research research uh, on this pro on this subject. And I uh, so weird in my talk. Okay, so let me get this a little closer. <laughs> sorry, I'm like, the thing. Um, but uh, so yeah, I heard about Kickstarter, and I also I also back this was like 2010, I believe. Uh, I was also aware of some of the criticism, and that it was problematic. There were other things people were telling me, but I had to do something because I was like, wow, I, really, I had spent time in Alaska already, and I really wanted to get back up there. So I ended up raising the raising the money for uh, for the thing through Kickstarter, and I raised. Uh, for my travel expenses, I raised about I think twenty five. It was like twenty five hundred dollars or three thousand dollars to get up to uh, Juno. I took the state ferry up to Juno and then spent time in Juno for like a week, and then went out to uh, I flew to Anchorage, and then uh, flew out to the Aleutian Islands. I went to Unalaska and stayed out there for a couple weeks and uh, explored. That was fun. 
Mm. And uh, then like took a, I jumped on the state ferry that came back through the Aleutians and followed the track of the, of the boat that these guys were on, actually just going in reverse at the same time of year. So I wanted, I was curious to see what the landscape and the environment was like, you know. Um, anyhow, sorry. Um, <laughs> this is all like one big silly story. Anyhow, the, uh, the funny thing about the Kickstarter thing was I was really nervous that I wasn't going to make it. I was really, really anxious. And uh, I had gone out. Um, we, and, you know, everybody was like, well, if you make halfway by, um, like, the, you know, if you get halfway by, like, a certain, by the halfway point of your campaign, you're fine. Or if you get 70 or 80%, you know. So I, I was like, okay, I don't know if we're going to make it. Everybody's like, relax, relax, relax. I'm like, oh, man, I don't know. So I'm like, you know, how am I gonna how am I gonna do this if I you know if I don't get the money? Because you don't get like unless you do it all, you don't get it, I guess, right? Right. Because yeah. I, I mean, I wouldn't. I, I found out that I got it, but right. it was funny. Um, so I went out. I went out with friends to a trivia night, and uh, we were out uh, having some drinks and stuff and playing trivia, and uh, we won. And like we won, uh, we just won a bar tab. So I was like, I'm feeling pretty lucky, you know. So I. Uh, <laughs> I played Kino that night. I played a, I bought a Kino ticket from the bar, and uh, one ticket, and I won like, it was like two thousand dollars on like one ticket, and I was like, okay, I'm not worried about like funding the rest of this Kickstarter now. <laughs> you know, I was kind of sweating it, but it made it on its own. So and I had a, there's another method to yeah, gain your good method. right, right. I've tried it again since then. It's not been so successful. Selling but drugs is good too. Hmm. But yeah, well, robbing banks very yeah. useful. I haven't thought about uh, those. Rich Uncle is also a really oh, good yeah. um, method. Inheritance. <laughs> sorry about treasure. the long. Sorry about the long convoluted. No, it's it's good to get the stories, thing. and I, I think, uh, I mean, uh, we probably should talk a little bit about uh, things that we like about this, the, these sorts of funding methods. I want to make sure that we like include in this conversation mm -hmm. the kind of grant getting that Marnie has been talking about, or. Um, Box, you didn't say anything about the way that retrofit works on subscription, but I think the subscription model is also um, something relatively new for indie comics, like the idea that you could... I stole, I stole the idea from Alec Longstreth. Yeah, <laughs> but there's, there aren't that many people who are selling minis or indie comics by subscription. There's, Such there, a great there, idea. I there have been many it's, more. Hard, it's really hard to do it on your own because yeah. when you're just selling subscriptions of your own work, even though you're continually working, it's... Uh, it's a, you know, a forced deadline on yourself to, it was much easier. I mean, when I started doing Everything Dies, that was my whole plan. I was like, I'll just put out a mini every, a book every few months whenever it's done. But even though it was kind of like an arbitrary deadline and arbitrary pressure I was putting on myself, it became like really um, difficult to deal with, I guess. I don't know. It's much easier once other people are providing you with the comics that you know. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's truth. like because making the comics is like a whole job, but 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 shipping and managing a mailing list, a subscription list, is a whole nother job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like a whole nother thing that has nothing to do really with making comics. So I forget what my point was, but <laughs> those two things are different. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the thing that I think undoes a lot of comic Kickstarters to like segue a little bit is um, people don't quite understand what they're in for. And while I hear a lot of complaints about the potential of fraud on Kickstarter, I think if you're going to be disappointed by any project you back, it's about 100 times more likely that the person who's running the project just doesn't anticipate the demand and is overwhelmed by the prospect of licking all those stamps and packing all those envelopes. Because, um, I mean, a lot of comic Kickstarters get up into the hundreds, a lot get up into the thousands of backers, and each of those people needs a book mailed to them. <laughs> and um, if it's, you know, Baby's first Kickstarter and it's their first book, and they don't have a postage printer and they don't have, you know, a Dymo label printer and uh, an online postage account that they can feed $400 into at a time and print out the stamps at home, they're facing several weeks of hauling backpack after backpack yeah. after backpack down to the post office. And it's, it's a huge undertaking. I mean, when we did Secret, when I printed Secret Prison 7, which is a, a large book, it's yeah. like this big or whatever, it came on a, it, it was a thousand copies of this book and it was delivered to my house on a pallet and it was like 900 yeah. pounds and they just dropped it right in front of my house. And then me and my wife just like carried it one by one <laughs> in the house. And then 
you know, and then we packed them all into envelopes, and the, um, the stack of envelopes went from the floor to the ceiling. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, and, you know, we only had, like, 400 backers or something like yeah. that, and it was just a huge undertaking. Smut yeah. Peddler was in the thousands, and it took two weeks of bribing friends with food to come over and stuff envelopes <laughs> and line them up against the wall. And then every night, my husband would come home from work change get out the dolly because we bought a dolly <laughs> and fill it up with orders and thank god he didn't have to deal with the uh postage clerks he could just take it to again this is just us we were very lucky we live next to what is probably the only 24-hour post office <laughs> in chicago 11 o'clock at night imagine a dolly stacked this high being pushed in through the door and my husband just kind of dumping it all in the you know to be delivered area and then pushing it back and um, that went on and on and on. And we were really well prepared, and we knew what we were doing. We have rented storage space, and we have people that know how to pack books, and we had envelopes we knew would fit, and everything was streamlined, and it still took us two weeks. Yeah, I, So I, I really see. feel for kids who are like, let's put together an anthology. We're fresh out of college, and we have no idea what we're doing. And they get like 1,500 backers, and it takes them forever to fulfill, and I totally understand well, why. There was a, um, it's funny, once you do a Kickstarter, you feel like an expert or something, and, <laughs> and you can look at a Kickstarter campaign and be, mm -hmm. and be like, okay, this person mm -hmm. clearly is, they're, they're, you know, their, mm -hmm. their rewards are screwed up. Yeah. Like, That's really person. important to remember, the rewards that you promise people. Yes. You gotta be really careful, and like, pick, get your stuff, get stuff like that you, if you're giving rewards out to people, Get that stuff done. Make sure it's finished before you do your project. Like have that stuff finished, if possible, um, because it's yeah. a it's, like it's a, a second, nightmare. Thing, like a Kickstarter with a, a lot of rewards like that mm -hmm. becomes almost like a second project. Yeah, on it, its own. it, oh, it yeah. is. It has but it has become for me that yeah. definitely. Yeah, I mean I enjoy it, but it's still it's. Like, I've seen oh, it's I've seen projects yeah. there. It's like I always. I am mercenary. I will totally cop to that. And I approach a lot of my Kickstarter projects from, because this is like my one gig. There is no day job. This is what I do. So uh, I look at stuff in terms of profitability and profit margin and stuff. And I see Kickstarters where every single level is like keychain, t shirt, um, dongle for your phone, you know, and, you know, hoodie and stuff like that. And I'm all like, wow, that all of that is just your profit margin being. Yeah, and I, you're gonna come out of this with a net zero if you really have to make 53 t-shirts and 42 yeah. duffel bags and make your rewards. Um, yeah. uh, my favorite reward is something that is on paper because it weighs almost nothing, <laughs> and 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 weight is a huge deal when it comes to shipping. And international shipping yeah. is, is crazy is God. right now. Always offer a PDF. That will that will take down a Kickstarter and the, the Sullivan Sluggers. Can we talk about? Is everybody go nuts? Should I want to hear it. Talk about Sullivan Sluggers. So I don't know what it is. You have, to, yeah, you have to actually tell the, yeah, the, start, tell the story. I don't know the whole story. Okay, I so, know bits and pieces. I okay, want to compare so it to what you know. Tell, let's try to tell the whole story. So the, yeah. this guy did this book called Sullivan Sluggers. He hired a, um, a really good artist named Brandon Graham to do this, this story. It's Not like, James Stokoe? It's Stoko? like zombie what? baseball. It was James, James Stokoe, Stoko, the orc stain guy. I get those guys confused. Uh, yeah. They're both really great. Yes, they are. Um, cool. So they, they hired him to do the book, and, the, and and he raised all this money, like 80 grand or something. A lot. But he did all these push goals, and part of the push goals were all like, all right, it's going to be a hardcover book now. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're going to print it at, I forget, some special size. It's double the size. Um, and, you know, adding all these extra things. And then, and then after it was done, they raised the rates on, they raised the international postage rates, and he didn't... Think, he didn't plan for the fact that these n new big books are going to cost double as much to a ship. A fortune, yeah. So he ended up being like, I, I mean, almost do. He did he do another Kickstarter to he like yeah. helped. It was really like he. I could. I. I felt bad for him kind of mm -hmm. because all the all is the people that backed it and and other people too were really criticizing this Kickstarter because he had like um, raised all this money and it was a lot of money. You know, eighty thousand dollars seems like a ton of money, mm -hmm. but he didn't plan for all this stuff, and he was he, he must have been he was taking a bath and, uh, at, at some point I think yeah. I think he probably lost money on it. Yeah, uh, the number that you see, like when a Kickstarter closes out and it's at like one hundred fifty thousand or eighty five thousand or whatever, I think a lot of people have this image in their head of like the computer doing this cartoon and like a little check sails out, and then you grab it and put it in your pocket. That is not how it works at all. Like, all that money is probably spoken for. I know when I did the uh, the Smut Peddler Kickstarter, got to 83. And a big chunk of that went back to the artists because part of the 
concept of the Kickstarter was the more people give, the more the artists get. At the end of the day, every story in Smut Peddler had a $600 bonus, and there are 23 stories in here. So, you know, 23 times 600, I'm an artist, not an accountant, you do it. And um, then again, the print bill ended up being about $18,000, not counting shipping. So that, you know, goes into storage, and storage is 250 a month, and then all the, all the shipping comes through. And if I'm lucky, and you're in the lower 48, I can ship it media mail. And, you know, this is a pretty big book, so it's about $3 media mail to ship this book. But if I'm unlucky, you live in friggin' Thailand, Thailand, and you need to like, <laughs> I need to like ship it over there or whatever. And at the end of the day, you know, the, the profit was not insane. But what I do it for, because again, I see all this from a business standpoint, it was kind of like at the end of the day, I cleared for all my time and effort about $6,000. But what I also cleared was a warehouse full of books to sell for the next two years. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. that's what, that's the, like the product. You have the product. Yeah, I yeah. have the product. I would, say, I would say like one way to think about your expenses, I guess we're sort of thinking about advice to people who mm. might do a Kickstarter. One way to think about the project costs is there are two kinds of costs involved with, uh, with self-publishing. Mm -hmm. There are costs that are not that don't scale with the number of things you sell. So, like, mm -hmm. if you're going to pay people a flat rate for the art that's in your book, that doesn't that doesn't cost more if you make 500 copies, unless yeah. you make a promise the way that Spike did to the artists that you'd pay them more. Mm -hmm. um, but like that, that basically doesn't scale. Or like some of the costs of printing don't scale with the number of things. If you're offset printing something, a lot of the cost is in the setup for the offset printing. And then individual copies, like printing another hundred might cost you only a hundred bucks, but the first hundred are going to cost you like nine hundred dollars to print. Yeah. yeah. And uh, at the end of the day, I printed about. 4,300. The 300 was actually overage. I asked for 4,000. They're like, we printed 300 extra. We're just going to mail them to you, okay? Okay? Yeah. Sure. And uh, yeah, that uh, I'm down but to the, about 1,000 now. So. But the, a lot of the costs that are associated with Kickstarter or with any mm -hmm. self-publishing are, are scaling costs that yeah. cost that much no matter whether you have extra backers or not. There are so postage for shipping out their rewards, that's going to cost the same no matter how many people you have coming in, or same percentage mm -hmm. no matter how many people you come in. Uh, the the key fees that go to Kickstarter and Amazon also cost the same percentage mm -hmm. no matter how many people you have coming in. And you can think of those as being like a fraction of the money that's just going to continue to be spoken for no matter how successful your yeah. campaign Always is. Always assume 10% like, is yeah. going put to... Even 20%. You know, I mean, Amazon and Kickstarter. Am yeah. Like Kickstarter takes a straight 5% no matter what. And the Amazon fees plus there will always be pledges that don't come through. Yeah. So between three and five, I always assume five. So when it's time to print a book, just you know, get your quote, add ten percent on top of that. And then think about also postage and things like and that. And postage. That, that yeah, one of the interesting things about Kickstarter, and keep in mind, I'm hearing this third, fourth hand, but uh, it was never their intention to be used as sort of a pre-order facilitator. They kind of never anticipated what is happening to them to be happening. Uh, they, they kind of figured they'd always be that site where help this girls club put a satellite in suborbit and for $20 you can get this photograph of all the girls in the club going, thank you. You know, they didn't expect people showing up going, fun tomorrow girl, half a million dollars. Yeah. You know, that was never the plan. So they have been slowly and steadily adding stuff behind the scenes on the dashboard to uh, help with the pre-order thing. And my favorite thing they've added is probably international oh, shipping shit. tack on <laughs> automatic. So, you know, if someone backs it, it asks you, what country are you in? And they're like, you will have to pay an extra 10. Do you understand that? Although it's worth pointing out that even though yeah. you, that automatically takes an extra $10 from the backer, mm -hmm. um, that $10 is, um, it adds to the, the money progress toward the goal. Yeah. But it doesn't actually go to any of your expenses other than postage. Right. So every international backer, if you set the international backing to be the actual cost of shipping the thing, if you can know what that is. Um, if you, if you set, suppose you ask for 10 extra dollars for international shipping because that's what it costs, that $10 doesn't actually go toward your project. It's just mm -hmm. going to shipping that person's yeah. thing. So, so it, it actually uh, cuts down on the amount of funding you have to send to the, yeah. print, the right. printer to pay for the thing that you're trying right. to print. Um, it, it, there are so many, I mean, if you're considering crowdfunding a, a, a project, there's so many little uh, like 
uh, little cuts yeah. that get taken out and that you have to really account for. And what it means is that if you're being responsible, you wind up asking for a lot more money than it looks like you uh, Who needs $20,000 $20, yeah. to publish a comic? Me. Yeah. You want to see the math? I did it. That's how I know I need $20,000. Yeah. Um, do you guys, do, do, um, do you want to talk about like the benefits you see in a process like this? I mean, the obvious one is that you have money in your pocket that you can use to yeah. fund things, but there must be other sort of uh, less there's financial... A new, there's an audience in Kickstarter. Yes, absolutely. Um, people probably wonder why, you know, well, why don't you use this crowdfunding site, that crowdfunding site? Because the the walkthrough traffic on Kickstarter is insane. Yeah. Just like, people wandering around looking in their favorite sections, and ba they have no idea who you are, but they back you because your project looks interesting. Cool. Yeah. Every single project I do between 20 and 25% of the backers, and I know this because the it, Kickstarter yeah, dashboard tells you. tells you, 20 to 25% of the backers are just people who are wandering through the comic section and went, oh, yeah. back. And no other site offers that. And if I did that on my website, all of my Kickstarters would have at least 20 to 25% less. Less money. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I don't do it on my site. That's I do it on Kickstarter because that's where the money is. That's Plus where the eyes streamlined. are. streamlined. If you did yeah. it on your own site, you'd have to do all of that stuff on, like, Start yeah. from scratch and do it all on your own. This cool. is like made for yeah. all of this. Plus, uh, I, I think everyone knows, you can kind of assume at this point, Kickstarter has the whole all or nothing thing. And every once in a while, I'll see a project on like Indiegogo that's a publishing project and it'll be asking for $10,000 and it'll have like, you know, a 30 day limit and it'll make 3,800, you know? And it's kind of like, what do you do? Because that site has something called flex funding, which means you get it no matter if you hit the goal or not. But if you have to publish, if you need 10,000 to publish the book and you end up with 3,800, like I, I don't actually understand what you're supposed to do. It just know? comes out of pocket. I mean, yeah. you have to be willing to be like, yeah. okay, this will fund part of the project. Yeah, but like, what if you haven't got that kind of money? Like, do you just sit there on $3,800 and not give people their book? Kickstarter is just a lot more elegant to me. It makes a lot more sense. Like. Okay, I, I didn't make gold. Nobody gets anything, and nobody gets anything taken from them. Cool, we're good. I always think that Indiegogo is good for stuff that really needs donations. Like, yeah. for instance, like my a record store burned down in my hometown, and they used Indiegogo to mm -hmm. actually, they, they needed actual charity yeah, for their shop, you yeah. know what I mean? So whatever they got was good. Right, you right, know? yeah. It's I mean, for actual charity stuff, I, it totally makes sense to me. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's like... Indiegogo still it doesn't have the eyeballs that and Kickstarter it has. The Kickstarter thing with the with yeah. the goal thing gives it incentivize well once you get close to that yeah. goal, everybody's like, Oh my god, we, let's be, yeah. I wanna be the one to make yeah. it closer it's, somehow. It's a weird thing because you're like, yeah. Who cares? It's actually kind of fun because every once I look for excuses to tweet about my Kickstarters when they're going on. I'm all like, Oh, we're half funded, we're three quarters funded, yeah. who wants to be the one Any to get us to ten thousand? Yeah. yeah, when you tweet something like who wants to be the one to get us to 10,000? You'll get like boom, 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 like four or five pledges all at once because, oh, four or five people want to be the ones to get us to 10,000. Yeah. I always think that um, when I, I was thinking about doing a Kickstarter um, recently for a project, and I was, um, you know, I was looking through, you know, weighing my options. Should, um. I, should I do a Kickstarter? Should I not? Um, I'm sorry, I forgot what we we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about how amazing Kickstarter is. No, no, wait. I was I wanted to respond to something you just said, but I can't remember. Yeah. Um, mm. It'll come to me. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Do, but, but while we're having a brief pause, um, I wanted to ask if um, Marnie wanted yeah. to say something. Yeah, about, sure. About, Sorry about, about this, Marnie. I'm totally about the it. odd I mean, one out. I've never done a Kickstarter. Yeah, I fund but I'm, I'm all really of my interested in hearing about hearing about how you find your way into the grant. Mm. grant seeking and also like where, where you see the like the it benefits. does is that only well n yeah benefits and also like does it does it seem to apply more to certain sorts of projects I think that's probably absolutely the case my background is in uh, printmaking and artist books and so my my training my my uh, undergraduate and graduate training is was gearing towards that more fine fine art world, which I completely abandoned. <laughs> Good but, for you. Yeah, I know, forget that. <laughs> but, um, but there's a lot of resources out there that I think a lot of people in the comics community don't think are for them, and they totally are. And Zarek is unfortunately no more. They switched to supporting charitable organizations, which is hard to begrudge, but it's such a loss. Mm. Um, but there are uh, a lot of citywide and statewide and federal art 
grants, grants that if people don't apply to them and there aren't enough people who get them, that money disappears and they don't get it the next year. So there is a, the, the grant that I got that's a, a Chicago City grant, the Chicago Assist, Arts Assistance Program grant, um, was recommended to me by a friend who's a printmaker and she said, you have to apply. They've gotten so many fewer applicants in the last few years, I think because of Kickstarter, y'all. <laughs> right. um, <laughs> so the, um, the amount of money that the city allocates for the arts, just money from the city to make your project is dwindling. Mm. And it's already challenging enough to get money for the arts from anywhere. So I applied thinking there's no way a comic would be approved by the city of Chicago. And lo and behold, <laughs> I got to make a really beautiful run with hand printed covers and offset pages uh, that I wouldn't have gotten to do otherwise. Nice. I think, yeah, yeah, it was really wonderful. And I think and there are a lot of resources. There's the, uh, the SAW micro grant, the sequential arts mm -hmm. workshop, a couple times a year. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they're small, they're like $250, but that's enough. Mm -hmm. To get something done, there's the Prism Comics Queer Press Grant, yeah, I'm which is pretty wonderful. Blue Delaquanti, go check her out. She does good stuff. Really great. Um, and I think something that's interesting, which I don't know if it's necessarily the right way that it should be thought about, but when you have when you have some grants under your belt, you are looked at a little bit differently. It's kind of horrible that that's the case. But <laughs> applying to like applying to residency, so you have a little bit of a time time aside just to make work, like there's a part of the application where they ask about what grants you've gotten, and I'm not sure if a Kickstarter project would, would fit that bill. Mm. Um, so as for if every project is appropriate for that, I don't know. Like My, my work is um, a little bit abstract and a little bit arty. It's less traditional comics. Um, but the Chicago grant that I was talking about before, Sam Sharp, who does really amazing comics in Chicago, he got the same grant last year to print Viewatron 2. And I think it's a terrific book. Oh, it blew my mind. Yeah. I, I read it at a lunch break and couldn't work for the rest of the day. It was really <laughs> 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 poor, poor planning on my part. Mm. Um, but yeah, like really seriously, go look at your like countywide, citywide. There's weird pockets of money out there, and if you don't apply, it disappears because then that line item of the budget, you know, mm. why would they? Why would they put? Mm. It there is a lot of grant money out there. It's it's there. You just kind of like you got to fish around for it. Yeah. I've, I found a lot of stuff, and I, I kind of lucked into um, I lucked into a State Department grant um, when I was at TCAF, I guess two years ago. Um, I really wanted to go to Russia, so I was introduced to um, Philippe Girard. You know, he's a, a Quebecois a cartoonist, and this uh, guy introduced me to uh, Dimi, Dima Yakovlev, who's the founder of Boomfest in St. Petersburg. So Dima. Uh, through the Russian consulate, uh, arranged me to get a State Department grant, and I went to I went to St. Petersburg for two weeks. That's cool. Partied hard. <laughs> Not really. I did some research. I was there for a I was there for the Boomfest Comics Festival, but I also did manage to do some some research for like a week while I was there. So they but the State Department State Department funded all that. And all and you have to do great. is be meticulous. Like yeah. Uh, in cross the, your T's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, cross your T's. There is a line in the like five or six page of instructions for the Chicago grant that I got that said you had to staple four of the forms and paper clip the fifth. And I heard from somebody who was, had been on the deciding panel a couple years before that was there just to weed people out to see that everybody read every line of the thing. Oregon does it, this. It's, Oregon's it's, like that too. They're they brown and ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I wonder uh, the the um, some of what Marnie uh, was saying, and I think even also what Todd is saying about uh, grant applications. I, I wonder if there's a way we can kind of feed that back into our conversation about Kickstarter. I, I think if grant applications seem to be particularly good for certain sorts of projects, and there are other projects like maybe I don't know Smut Peddler that would be less likely to pick up a state grant. I was grant. thinking that this <laughs> whole time. Right? I mean, not to say yeah. that it, it's a good book, but it, it's not it's the sort of thing that a city book. or a state might necessarily want to attach their name yeah, to. Yeah, um, Smut Peddler but, is an interesting case. But I think, I wonder whether there's a, uh, there, I think there's a perception, I don't know whether it's true, but I think there's a perception that Kickstarter has a sort of flip side problem that that, uh, and I've heard people say things similar to this on the internet that, that you know, uh, Kickstarter's great for, you know, uh, 
crowdfunding the publication of your science fiction webcomic that already has a great big mm -hmm. uh, audience built in, but if you don't have a popular audience or if you're not doing something that is the sort of thing that would have a popular audience, you know, Kickstarter might not be good for that, or it might, and, and I, I don't know whether that criticism is true or in, whether it reflects our experience, but to I think my I mean, mind, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't buy that Sorry. for starters. I mean, uh, I hear that a lot. I hear a lot of, oh, oh, you know, Kickstarter is only good if you already have an audience. And uh, I would append that to Kickstarter will be more profitable if you have an audience. Sure. But I have seen, I have personally funded anthologies by kids just getting ready to graduate from school with nothing, like a tumbleweed blowing across their resumes, and their anthology got funded. Uh, there are artists who, you can see their progression where they just started out on Kickstarter, and their first project was for 800, and then their second was for 2,000, and their third was for 8,000. Just because you don't have a big audience or years of experience doesn't mean your Kickstarter is not going to work. It just means you're going to have to be a lot more frugal about your ambitions with your Kickstarter. You will not make half a million dollars on your first Kickstarter if no one knows who you are. But that doesn't mean if you have a good idea and you've done the work and you've got your quote and you have something to show people, like pages on the Kickstarter page of your comics so people know what they're getting, that doesn't mean you can't get like a little two or three thousand dollar project funded. I, I just don't buy it when people say, unless you're famous, you can't use Kickstarter because I own books by people who are just 19, 20 year old kids off there. Books. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking, well, what I wanted to say before was that the thing with Kickstarter, and, and this is the difference between grant, getting grants and stuff, you can like search out a million grants on your own at your own pace and, and, and mm -hmm. then you get the money. But if you're doing a Kickstarter, you have to be like in public constantly. You have to be yeah. like oh, yelling yeah. from the rooftops and be like, I'm out here making this thing happen. Yeah. It's like living on a high gravity planet for that's 30 true. days. You mean like that's that? That's true. You have to be constantly on top of it. The, t yeah. the thing that is the most daunting, this is what I want to say earlier. When I was thinking about doing another Kickstarter, I was like, do I really have it in me to spend an entire month on Twitter and Facebook and Tumblr being like, <sighs> mm. yeah. look at my Kickstarter. <laughs> And then, you know, yeah. I do, promote, I, ha I promote, don't know. Promote, yeah. It's like a yeah. stressful period. You think it's like all wine and, you know, yeah. roses or whatever, but it's very stressful oh, it's that month. Yeah. Yeah. But Kickstarter is not a place to find an audience. Yeah. Did step, like, don't put something on there thinking this is where the fans are. Yeah, I wonder, like, I, we, uh, part of what we're saying right now is, is, is a good answer to the question yeah. I asked, but I, I'm also thinking not just about, like, if you have an audience already, Kickstarter is easier to use. That's obvious. But yeah. also, like, it depends, I think, also... It, or does it depend somewhat on the sort of project? I mean, if it's a sort of more artistic mm -hmm. project or something abstract and silent, or if it's something that might be very like personal and uh, kind of uh, gritty looking, but not uh, sensationalistic or whatever. I mean, I, I'm thinking about how like the things that I see getting best funded mm -hmm. do tend to have a hook, a genre hook usually, that is one that has a fairly substantial uh, online community interested in it sure. already. It's yeah. like any, I mean, you know, I mean, you could, people that hang out on the internet all day, <laughs> I, are, they have certain things that they're into. I mean, like, yeah. you could say that the internet is a completely democratic society, whatever, and it kind of in some ways is, because there's everybody has a chance. But, like, the people that really are all over the internet all the time, you know, there's a reason why the biggest webcomic that exists is a gaming webcomic. Yeah. Because those people that are into games are on the internet fucking excuse me, like every, just all the time, you know, and, and yeah. the other, you know, and, and, and genre stuff maybe too. You also know what's on the internet a lot. No, actually, actually, no, that's, that's not even fair to say because, um, part of the reason I think Smut Peddler did so well on Kickstarter and continues to do really well in sort of a, you know, sales sense is, uh, it's a niche that's being filled that was 90%. <laughs> 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 yeah. But uh, <laughs> like if you go on, I say this like at every single time I mention Smut Peddler, but if you go on Tumblr, you will find like some of the raunchiest porno on there is by women and it's for women. And the commercial aspect of pornography for women, most of it quite honestly is either romance novels, which by the way is what's keeping bookstores afloat, which is why when you walk into a bookstore, it's just like from here to the horizon line, a line of romance novels. And um, yaoi, 
that is, you know, being translated and brought over. But uh, she said, "Yowie, Yowie. not uh, Yahweh." Zowie, it's Yowie. Um, Yahweh is a totally different thing. Yeah, but he is in Smut Peddler. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously, like page eighty. Um, but uh, it's it's just something people could get behind, and I think in a lot of ways, women have this kind of. <laughs> You're easy. Yeah. Uh, it ha like women have this permission to get. Can you please stop talking in <laughs> sexual in you? <laughs> <laughs> women have this permission to sort of, like get behind a project like Smut Peddler and like wave their cheerleader pom-poms and be like, oh my God, yes, hooray for smut, hooray for porn for ladies. And that probably wouldn't happen if it was like specifically for dudes. Sure. And um, I think that's because, you know, female sexuality to this day is still sort of a really taboo kind of thing. There's still a lot of chicks out there who are all like, no, I don't like porn. It's like, are you sure you don't like porn? Or do you just like not like porn that's not, doesn't have you in mind? Yeah. And um, it's... If I may say, it's inspired a lot of really awesome, interesting projects like Queerotica, which is on sale here right now, and you should go get. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine trying to get a grant for Smut Peddler. And I've had people say, you know, well, you should have gone to, I don't know, Fantagraphics. You should have gone to so and so. You should have gone to this company. They would have totally funded it. But at the end of the day, why would I? I mean, I don't understand the appeal anymore. Well, I can think of reasons. I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm that, sure there that, are. That, but that storage, air, that storage unit that you're paying rent on, you know, like yeah. that would be. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the incentives but for that aren't necessarily monetary. Mm, true. Like it's not a. I mean, it's an investment in your future monetarily, but it's mm -hmm. not going to be a compete. It literally can't like I, maybe Fanographics can, or maybe <laughs> John Corley can. I mean, I don't really know what their finances are, but they really can't afford to pay what you could make on a Kickstarter. Like yeah, like. They're like you raised what for Smoke Peddler? Eighty three thousand. That is way beyond the scope of pretty much any one publisher's yeah. budget. No one would no not a single publisher on the planet would and hand you can me eighty three thousand. So much 000. more control over materiality mm -hmm. and size and yeah. And yeah, it's yeah. true. I mean, one of the things that I'm saying in my project right now is mm -hmm. like I, I could make these books for a little cheaper. But I want them to be on really nice paper, and I want the printing to look really good, and I want it to feel kind of creamy when it's in your hands because oh. you know I want it to be. Like <laughs> yeah. And, and my, my book is for kids. Don't think. Of, <laughs> or kid friendly anyway. But but I mean I want it to have a certain kind of like physical, um, ta tactile quality, and to do that costs more. Okay. Not a lot more if you're publishing enough of them, mm. but. And enough more that I couldn't just go and write a check for it. Right. You know? So, I, but, but um, I wanted also to say, and um, these books are here at the show, although uh, mm -hmm. Robin's not on the panel. But I wanted to say that it's not entirely true that you can't publish art comics using Kickstarter. You Robin can totally. Chapman uh, has a little print shop, a little, uh, I guess, uh, publishing house called Paper Rocket, where yeah, they, I they one publish. Of our they, she publishes most of her stuff using Kickstarter, and she asks for small amounts of money and does small print runs, and people fund them very quickly. I mean, I, it's not. I got the collected Deep Girl from her. So yeah, yeah. and um, she she's got a lot of interesting stuff, and it's not the sort of stuff that you would necessarily associate with, a, a, and it's never going to make eighty or ninety thousand yeah. dollars. But they're they're the sort of things that like, it, it's much easier for Robin to go and print these because she's able to get a little bit of money in advance from right. people who are willing to back it. Um, and I, I don't know where on the continuum between uh, like easily accessible genre stuff and really personal things, something like Alec Longstreth's uh, uh, Basswood falls. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it's genre-ish, but it's very personal also. Yeah. And you know, he got completely funded in 39 hours. I really think a lot of the soul, you know, Kickstarter hates <clears throat> genre X and Kickstarter only likes genre Y is people psyching themselves out. It's I from really a do. limited perspective. Yeah. Too. I mean, you, you can say that if you look, if you look at a bunch of Kickstarters or if you look at, you know, you've seen, you haven't seen every Kickstarter yeah. that's yeah. existed. You've seen <laughs> like five or whatever, yeah. 10, yeah, unless you're mind, trolling it all like, the time. I just did, I did Poorcraft, which is just a, you know, life hack book and then I did Smut Peddler which is just porn and then I did Sleep of Reason which is horror so three completely different genres and all of them were super funded so 
it's not like Kickstarter's like, no, we hate horror. You know? uh, let, let me, we, we don't have a ton of time, but I would like to take one or two questions. And uh, rather yeah. than making you march all the way to the mic, I'll try to repeat what you ask yeah. so that we get it on video. But um, could you go ahead and ask, what were you going to ask? I have a question more about the, the uh, grant thing. Uh, like when you get a grant for like $5,000 for a comic, do they sort of say, you know, do they put limits on like how you can market as being grant? Uh, and do they also say, you know, you, know, you, you get the print, you know, doc, you know, they give you the money and say, you can't resell it. It's like you're building it for a particular audience or is it just sort of, here's 5000 bucks. You can tell us what you're going to do. Go for it. Here's so the grant, the grant question, I, I okay. want to ask it again just so that it, comes through on the video. The question is like, if you publish a book using a grant, are there limits on the ways that you can sell it or market it? Is that more or less what you're asking? Sell it, market as well as um, just uh, you know, the logistics of how it works. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I've encountered as far as like marketing the, the book or anything like that, but I mean, the, the money is specifically allocated for certain yeah, you have, you have to return receipts at the end of it to show that you didn't spend the five thousand dollars <laughs> gambling. <laughs> yeah. um, and sometimes at the back, you know, they ask that you acknowledge that you received funding for it, but you, that can be as, you know, as small in you know the credits section mm -hmm. as as you need it to be. Uh, it's pretty. The the ones that I've worked with have been really, really loose and flexible as far as that goes. No no limitations on on marketing or any of the things that you're asking about. It was. Here's a check. Be sure within a year to send us all of your receipts, mm -hmm. or else. And I don't know what the or else would be. Like I don't know what happened. <laughs> it's Chicago, so it might be kind of bad. <laughs> Debtor's prison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, okay. You. I guess you're already next. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is actually not so much a question, but uh, advice from my own perspective, uh, having a background in uh, entertainment law. There is an organization which. Not too many young artists know about, and they should. It's called the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. There are yeah. chapters in every state. Uh, they are helpful, and they, they give either free or discounted legal services to artists. They can help you with grant writing, uh, tax implications for projects like Kickstarter, any kind of fundraising, and just anything that, that might come up. Yeah, actually, uh, just go find it. I have a uh, I have account an accountant now because I kind of need one and. Uh, he says that tax law is always going to be like several years behind what's going on. And for now, I was like, what do I do with Kickstarter? And he's like, just count it as sales because that's what it is. You're selling people books. So. Yeah, I, I actually, uh, the first Kickstarter campaign I ran, I, I took. we were going in to get our taxes done. And I was trying to describe how I got this money <laughs> to the accountant. And he couldn't wrap his head around it. It was like... He, not only had he not heard of Kickstarter, but he had no idea. So you know, he didn't understand how to process. Mm -hmm. So they give you money for something that you haven't made yet. Yeah. How yeah. does that work? Also, warn your bank. Um, I have a when I when I changed uh, when I changed banks recently. I I actually had to go in and I had a talk with their with their business account guy, and I was just like, all right, my accounts are going to look really really weird. Uh, it's going to look like you know, two thousand in, fifteen hundred in. Three thousand two hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars in. I'm not laundering money. Please don't shut me down. So that couldn't um, hurt. We can probably do two or three more questions. So uh, I guess my question is also sort of about restrictions from the other end of both the Kickstarter and in grants. Do you think could you think about which ones are better, or how do you think about money for printing versus mm -hmm. money to live on while you make a book? Uh, I. <laughs> I've never asked for money to live yeah. on while I make the book. Um, I'm I'm pretty much always the last person to get paid in all my projects. So that's just that's a personal philosophy. I've seen Kickstarters that ask for money to to live on, and I've seen them succeed, and I've seen them fail. I think mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's down to audience and it's down to track record. Like, I think that um, I, 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 this might be a limited um, perspective, but I think that people. Um, feel better about giving you money for a product mm -hmm. than they do about giving you money to work on the product, like to live. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a different thing, different mentality that goes into it. It's I'm, uh, I'm the exception, I guess, to that because mm -hmm. I would, you know, I wasn't getting the money to live on, but I was definitely getting the money so that I could survive while I was traveling. So there were some funds that were allocated for that. Um, so, but you know, you don't want to like, yeah, I don't, I, as far as like publishing a book, I mean, you don't want to say I'm asking for like, $85,000 to publish this book, plus 
$85,000 because I need, I need to live for a year while I'm doing all this stuff. Yeah. Right, because then there are questions yeah. like about standards of living and especially yeah. if you're getting like state or federal kind of funding, yeah. like there's a lot of questions for that. The grants that I've applied for are just for production. Right. And even limitations in uh, the instructions that it can't be for living costs. Uh, mm -hmm. With some caveats, like you can buy some food if it's for the event opening. You know, like mm -hmm. you can then submit a receipt for that, but not certainly not for yeah. a living. That's... I imagine I the grants job. would be a lot more. <laughs> the grants would be a lot more restrictive yeah, about that. Absolutely. I would love that though. Yeah, yeah. man. That'd I, be I, awesome. My next Kickstarter might be like, let me just get, give me like twenty grand to live on this year. And, <laughs> and it's worth noting, um, Kickstarter <laughs> does not allow. Yeah. yeah, they don't. They don't Kickstarter does not allow what they refer to as fund my life projects, which is like no rent parties, no my cat broke its leg and I can't afford the vet bill stuff. No paying for college. No paying for college. <laughs> so you can't kickstart stuff like that. Although there are sort of subtle veneer of fund my life things that will slip in under the radar. For example, if you say, I want to write a book about food in France and uh, to do that, I have to go to France and, and I have eat to food. and <laughs> eat food. And you know, if you can get that funded, more power to you. Yeah. I've seen people try, none that, of them manage. That would that would be pretty there was awesome. A number of comics Kickstarters that involve travel though. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I can, off the top of my head, just that, the Ted Rawl campaign. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Went he to went to Afghanistan. 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 Yeah. 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 But that's like kind of one of those things that's clearly, you know, necessary for them. Yeah. Well, let's take one more question. Uh, maybe this guy back here, and then uh, and then we'll need to clear out to make room for the next panel. So. Okay. Hi, I'd just like to know um, specifically, like, what rewards you guys offer for your campaigns and okay. how much you ask for them. Okay. Um, well, 90% <laughs> of the people who back my campaigns go for either just nothing but the paperback or nothing but the PDF. And chances are, if you're doing a comic campaign, that's where most of the money's going to be, just people who just don't, they don't care about anything. They want the book or they want just a PDF copy. Um, but when you get up in the fancy tiers, for poor craft, you'll notice that there are three people having a picnic on the front of this book behind the main characters. Those three people paid $250 a piece <laughs> to be on the front cover. Yeah. And yeah, we're, we're offering on, a lot of cameo appearances and things and like that. And on the inside, there are a bunch more cameos, including a cat named Dusty, who is sitting in the uh, window of a bookshop called Dusty Books, because that woman paid for a cameo, and during the course of the Kickstarter, her cat died. So she asked if I could put Dusty the cat uh -huh. in, in the book. Um, in Smut Peddler, you'll notice there are two people on the back who are not actually characters from any of the stories. They paid $500 to be on the back of Smut Peddler. There are no cameos, sadly, in Smut Peddler. <laughs> that would have been pretty good. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> whenever I do an anthology project, I send out an email on the list, and I go, it's Kickstarter time. Does anyone here want to donate something to the, pro to the Kickstarter to just you know, drum up interest? Yeah. Uh, you will not be reimbursed unless it's something major. Like, for an instance, someone made a one-of-a-kind monster doll, and that one on there, I will reimburse them for that. Uh, but... People donate, you know, I'll do a commission, uh, I'll make a little felted uh, backwoods monster and put that up on, on that. I'll, I'll give someone a page from the comic that I made for Smut Peddler randomly in the mail. Publishing credits of them. Publishing, oh, and in the back. Yeah. The, the, if, you, if you get a copy of Smut Peddler, which I hardly recommend you do, um, if you go in the back, you'll note there are about three or four pages of thank yous. And uh, you could thank whoever you wanted in here. So I, I believe Rick Santorum <laughs> is, is thanked in here. Uh, a few, a few like crime bosses from the 1940s. The, whatever, whatever they wanted could be thanked in there. So thank you, pages. Of course, in 2009, there were considerably less people on Kickstarter. So the thank you page for Poorcraft is significantly shorter. But yeah, um, and there's always a good. In my personal opinion. The ego, egomaniac tier is always very, very profitable. When there's always, there's always yeah. someone. It's like, put me on the you know, cover, a, put um, me in the story. The other one, one note about those particular types of rewards mm -hmm. and why they're really good yeah. is because that all that stuff you just described added zero weight to your yeah. shipping. You don't have to go out yeah. to a third party. That, I'm not kidding about that. Yeah. That is like a legit thing, man. Like, there's no extra product involved in that. Yeah. Yeah, this I is had just, be, just had upload the half-finished front cover and be all like, your face here, $500. I had thanked people on the, on the, on the website and stuff. Um, and, but I, I didn't thank anyone for the, in, the, in the book. Like, there weren't people. And I, I had, that was not part of the rewards thing. Um, mm -hmm. 
but I did have I did have a series of like small letterpress prints that I was doing as a supplement to the work. Um, so people got those cards, everything from those to thanks, and <laughs> yeah, and you know original drawings people bought from the work, mm -hmm. um, or I would just do original drawings for people too. So I had yeah. everything from though you know like that or, or to like a completely full sketchbook. You know it was like yeah. three thousand dollars or something. You know so. Stuff, yeah, you can, you, you know, gauge it, so. Yeah, yeah I, I, uh, our, our thing is serialized, so one of the thing, one of the rewards that we've got up right now is you can ask a question in between two issues, and one of the stories in the next issue will answer that question. Yeah. Wow. Um, but th th those are sort of particular to the genre that I'm working in, I think. Yeah. Um, nice. I can tell that we should be wrapping up yeah. right now, but let me ask you guys to thank the panelists, and uh, thank you all so much. Thank you.